Paul, uh, this is John Cerrone. Uh, you'll get used to learning our voices, I think. Um, thank you for joining us to put this presentation together. As architecture, as architects, um, you'll notice there's a lot of slides, uh, there's a lot of visuals, not a lot of text. So uh, bear with us, and we'll sort of take you through the architectural um, scope of, of services. Adam, I don't know if you want to. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, we're, we're basically, uh, maybe you want to go to the, the next slide. I mean, I, we, we've given our introductions and, and we'll give a little more, um, but we've organized it, uh, you know, why this webinar, we've organized it such that we want to, we have these three, four goals. First, we, we want to introduce um, AEC, which is Architecture, Engineering, and Construction, as the newest industry segment at Co. And um, and why we're there and so forth, and a little background on AC. I mean, AC, of course, being a, a, an enormous industry, but the last to join Co as an industry, and there's there's a number of reasons for that, um, and we're in some ways a little behind, but catching up very quickly. And then we want to go into some case studies of, of how we're using Katia and the 3D experience in industry, which um, you know each case is a little bit unique. As, as you know, we're adopting it, and then have a discussion. Yep. We've organized it into um, you know, into five points. A, a quick overview, and then each of us will present case studies. Uh, so first, a little background on on AC, and and really this could take easily the whole webinar. But you know, PLM is what. I think most CATIA users operate, you know, PLM is, is kind of the, uh, is the acronym that is associated with CATIA, but in architecture it's BIM, which is Building Information Modeling. And there's, you can see by this, this diagram, it's very similar to PLM, there's enormous potential. I mean, the, the construction industry is, is enormous, AC is enormous, and the life cycle of buildings is enormously complicated. The range of products within a building, um, you know, is, is a, uh, is an enormous logistical and, um, and and a complicated effort that is beginning to be tackled now. And you can see the kind of range here. And if you go to the next slide, the um, this is you know that architects have been adopting technology. Architects, engineering, construction um, have been adopting technology for a while. I, I think one of our our core challenges is how do we adopt technology? And this is a screenshot from a program called Revit. Which is most associated with BIM, and you know it's it's a um, it's a full 3D modeling program, but it's still geared towards uh, producing traditional drawing sets. It's not geared towards fabrication, fabrication, componentry, and thinking about buildings like that. It's it's geared towards producing traditional drawings that really leave out a lot of information and are tailored to a, a traditional workflow. Yeah. And, it, and it's meant to communicate intent, right? Which is Right, and it's you know there's a there's a, a long history, um, but there are it, it comes down to a number of, there's a number of challenges, and I think we're highlighting two here, and one is the complex contract structure of AC, which is that there's the architect um, and sub consultants, which include things like structural engineers, lighting designers, um, and so forth, are often separated from the uh, the CM or the the construction management firm that then has a set of subcontractors, plumbers, and so forth that um, that actually build the building. And that divide is a big deal. It's changing. It is. I, would, I would say across the board, everyone wants this model to change um, and really work towards an integrated process. The term integrated process delivery is a huge buzz phrase, uh, buzz buzz phrase, but buzzword in um, in AAC. But how that happens is very tricky. It's hard to have a single model when um, liability is distributed around. And I mean, fundamentally, this is you know what you're seeing. The people that design and generate their intent for design are not the people that make it traditionally. That is how it's structured. And there's not an arrow between the architect and the contractor typically. Yeah, and and there's a there's so many disciplines and trades involved in this process um, and each really have their own software or do not even use software they have their own contract structures um, and you know this is 
it's not an entirely controlled environment. Every project is unique. Every project has, is, you know, to some degree, generally built on site, um, and it's big and it's messy and it's complicated. And there's there's a legacy of, of structure. And I, I think one one key challenge and one theme of this presentation is is that, um, you know, I I I don't know other industries that well, but I think to some extent you can say that uh, automotive, aerospace, some of these other industries. The change there's there's some large entities, um, large companies that top down have an had or have an opportunity to control change. Whereas in AC, um, it's very distributed. And so I think a theme of this pre this presentation is how um, is how we're looking to to make change maybe bottom up to insert change into the process rather than kind of holistically top down do it. Okay, so we'll go very quickly, um, and I think so. We're I'm starting with um, uh, my firm, More Work. Um, next slide. Um, based in Brooklyn, at a hybrid of uh, a kind of range of architect, traditional architectural practice and research, um, and very closely working with academia, Columbia University, and New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, I, sh I should add too, I worked at Shop for eight years, so. I think this will be useful. A useful introduction is just academia in architecture is, um, you know, this is where it started. This is where a lot of us, I think, got into using ATIA and, and other kind of PLM type platforms. It's a, you know, the idea of data driven design and mechanics. You'll see how different architecture, I think it's worth seeing how different architectural education is, how it's very experimental. Um, and the notion now of kind of collaborative work, data driven, fabrication-based design um, and thinking of components is very novel. Um, you know, architecture is very idea-based and um, and it's, it tends to be fragmented into different pieces concerning those, you know, structure is something that happens over there and, um, you know, and the design is sort of separated and really integrating those into a, a single model um, is a fairly novel concept. And the, the education itself is, is really based in um, again, and ideas, and the idea of the, the kind of concept of, of stitching together um, and architectural ideas with, while well, simultaneously thinking about componentry and data, is fairly novel. So there's been a lot of experimentation, um, and and this is where I can say personally, and for some of us, where the um, where we got our like I said, where we got our introductions to Katia and uh, and the 3D experience, and really, it's really not. Um, you can see here, I mean, we're really working in, I think I would say that the kind of typical way of working for in engineering doesn't quite work for us. I mean, a lot of this you can see um, sketches are less used. It's more in a, in a shape design workbench. Um, in this case, it's actually looking at exploring a kind of, there's always a, there's often a layer of abstraction initially, a larger wireframe, and you can see too, a lot of heavily based in automation. That's a, you know, that's a key theme. And, and knowledge capture, componentry um, is a big deal too. Power copies, UDFs, um, document templates, reusing those, capturing knowledge. There's an enormous amount of kind of, of repetition panels and things like this in architecture, um, you know, that uh, that vary slightly. And this this is where this is what's being explored, and this is where um, we we found the value. But again, it, it's really, I mean, you can see again. From what's on the screen, probably doesn't look like a lot of the things, um, you know, that that is typically done in Katia. But this is this is the level of experimentation that's happening. This is the level of of uh, the effort to adapt these adapt the software that's not quite geared to what we do, um, but appropriate it selectively to um, to form a workflow. And that and, is and added into the yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to add, you know, often to generate sort of a field of conditions to, to set in criteria, and, and it is sort of at a global, at a, at a larger scale, it's at a macro level of a building or an urban, an urban development, and then there's the analysis portion. So it's, it's sort of deployment of automated uh, scenarios, and then an analysis. Right. And often I, I would say, you know, the Katia and the 3D experience. The, often doesn't do a hundred percent of it rarely does a hundred percent of what we want to do so uh, you know we're also linking it and you can kind of get the sense of it maybe from the visuals I won't talk to them too much we can come back to them if there's questions but 
um, it's, it's often linking to other software. Often there's still a kind of traditional, you know, concrete work or, you know, the schedules of installing doorknobs and things like that. Um, CATIA isn't really suited for, and, and there, is a, there is still room for a traditional process. So this, this, and even the facilities management and so forth, we're really looking at what is data in architecture. These, are, these remain to a degree open questions. Um, we're not quite at the level where, you know, everything is, is 3D printed or, or fabricated by robots. So there's sort of a, a, a sort of hybrid space that we're operating in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and with that, John, I, I mean, I can, I worked on some of these projects too, but John, yeah. you know, you can pick it up from here. Yeah, we're going to, I mean, this again, quite literally, in a lot of the people that worked on this project, you know, this, you know, a, a quick introduction to shop, but of course, we'll cover uh, Barclays Center, which has been presented before, so we'll, we'll stay away from some of the details of it and get more into, um, you know, sort of the overview. But uh, shop architects, is a, it's about a 180-person firm. Um, we're in downtown uh, Manhattan and working on a range of, of projects from, uh, you know, from the slimmest tower uh, just south of Central Park to public works on the East River to work in Africa, Botswana. There's an innovation hub um, under construction currently and, you know, residential work <coughs> uh, throughout Manhattan and now really expanding throughout the states and, and globally, um, projects in London, Australia, and, and other. <clears throat> the Barclays Center has been presented probably ad nauseum at, at, at um, events, but we do want to, this is a different audience, and what's important is coming off of, you know, Adam's discussion of academia, he, I learned Katia from Adam for this project. A lot of the people that worked on this project came directly through the classes that he and then eventually we both taught. Um, so the approach is very much indicative to, to how architects think. It is this very lightweight system of controls, of inputs, and a rational organization system, what we call the vertical grid at the bottom. So design curves in a vertical grid. And um, you know the concept of parametric design is nothing new now. It's certainly not new in in architecture now, but the scalability of what the Dassault systems allows us to do is what makes this work. Um, so as we receive information from engineers, from from designers, from fabricators, um, we continually generate or amend our templates and redeploy. So the very heavy in UDFs, uh, knowledge patterns, and document templates. And so as we scale up, the inputs sort of remain the same, and the templates get more robust. And I, so I would just, you know, I, yeah, I would go ahead. Too, that, you know, you saw the vertical grid, or you see this green line. This is a big deal, this notion of being able to kind of control interoperability mm -hmm. to distill to a couple set of points, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet, it's a set of um, geometry, or it's an inter interface with, um, you know, a machine code. There are so many players that we are working with, so many even different disciplines, yeah. even within an architecture firm. The ability to control our own workflow, to control our the own points of interoperability is, is a really big deal. Yes. For that, that green line remains active, and that's just one of the several factors high, highlighted. But these, the, for these things to stay active, um, is, that's absolutely of utmost importance because they do, they do shift the field, the patterns change. And all we need to know this the system has to be built in a robust fashion that these design curves dictate design wireframe surfaces, which will then run templates to become sheet metal parts, which will then build up into larger building blocks, the mega panel. All of this has to stay live. <clears throat> and so, so the document template, again, we build everything, what's not shown here, all of these are still based on a very simple wireframe structure, um, and we add those components. So uh, we do get to the, initially an architectural study will stay within a part um, in, in organized geo sets and then maybe several parts but eventually these document templates, it, it, it's a necessity that we break them into the sort of proper structure that each piece is its own component, it is its own part, it's its own solid model um, and it does have its own drawings and or um, 
cut file associated with it. So these, you know, the, the, the Barclay Center is, is, you know, 900 different mega panels, but the families of them are relatively repetitious. So this is how, um, you know, we're able to deliver this. The fabric's working directly with fabricators. These are the types, this is not traditional um, for an architectural scope, but delivering fabrication tickets. Uh, this is sort of a language that is not, you know, that, that initial slide of the architect and contractor, the divide, um, this is not a line of communication, mostly for litigious purposes, that is able to be crossed. Um, there's, again, we're, we're looking at this model changing. So this technology and this approach becomes increasingly important because, I, I would, go ahead. I would throw in there too that, you know, the, um, yeah, the, the idea that we can't just operate in a CATIA model or even a CATIA data set and share that or that even handing off a CATIA model or data set is not helpful for anyone. We have to go and look at, you know, the fabricator, what can they handle, what what are they used to, how can we tweak that, and how much can we vary it. And in this, so in this case, you know, they had no, they had a very kind of low, they were much lower tech than we were, and we had to go look at with them and say, what can you handle? And eventually we kind of came down to, well, we'll send you directly, machine code directly to your machines rather than having an intermediate layer. And that explicitly, again, it does require other software. So all of the, all of the fab tickets proper come out of CATIA. Um, they are associated with the document template, so there's very little post-production that has to be done. The cut files are CATIA drawings that we batch, uh, automate a save as a DWG file. So that's then brought into a separate nesting file, um, which we generate the code. So it's not, we're not saying that it's all, um, you know, in this enclosed system in, in the sort of the DSO platform, but a lot of it is, and a lot of what is able to happen is facilitated by it. Um, you know, the, the, to the point where every, every component is modeled, this really does become, and this is not traditional architecture uh, prog process, it is a model-driven system. There are often no drawings. We have to rely on things like laser scanning, uh, overlaid with fabrication models, um, to coordinate these pieces that because we are in control at a high resolution of the fabrication, we know what is being installed on the building. So that's what affords us the level of control of coordination. This is not traditional architecture um, process, which is intent. And all of this falls in the camp of the fabricator, typically, um, who is not typically a model-driven system. You're going to see a little bit different later. But what you're able to do then is communicate in, in model shot. You're able to give instructions in a very lightweight screen view. So just very quickly moving, you know, we, we've since uh, moved from V5 to the 3D experience um, and, and, and running, you know, the, the, the R&D that was involved in the in the arena, the systems that Adam set up and that Adam and I then set up um, are really scalable and this is traditionally not what an architect um, does. They start from scratch every time. So moving to the cloud and people that are on V6, this might not be sort of news, but from V5, you know, we have a very specific folder structure uh, set up and it all works. Our, our mega panels go somewhere and you can track it. What we're finding now is that this system works extremely well. Um, the the database-driven system is working and performing very well in terms of access to the information we need. Um, so this, you know, and I'm not going to let this play for long, but the idea that we're able now to just, we, we always know the pieces, components. We know the names. That's the first thing we set up as a nomenclature to, to organize our wireframes. The ability to access those as we add more information is is having, you know, I would say a sort of profound effect on our process. So I'm trying to go to the next slide. So the YouTube things are that's obnoxious. Of course it doesn't work. Well, why are setting this up to I would add that you know the fabricator isn't the end of the is not the end of the line. It also has to be assembled on site. There are still a number of other trade, yeah. you know, set of group companies and trades that execute this. Yeah. So, so you know, with that said, you know, we're we're taking you know what we learned on Barclays. We're able to now overlay our projects within an environment which we traditionally just 
just would never do. Um, and you know, this is it's scalable. We know what to do on on a on a cladding project. We know that it starts from a wider frame, and we have it's not they're not the same templates. They're always new instantiations. They're new, uh, you know, UDFs. There's new power copies. Everything that we are generating is new. But we know the process, and we're able to. We know to embed an unfolded solution if that's going to be down the road what we need. Um, we're able to go from digital to, to physical very quickly um, because we know the importance of this mock-up. We know how to produce it. So we're able to go sort of directly into um, you know design, into presentation, into into physical manifestation very quickly. We know that the laser scan is important. We're embedding point clouds into the experience. We know that we're going to deal with this stuff at a part component level. Um, so this is how we're treating design now. And this is carrying over the work we're doing in Botswana. And I'm actually not going to play this because it's YouTube. So we're creating these wireframes. And, and the system we have now, it's, fit, it's a totally different scenario. We have, you know, in, in, in weeks, we're creating mock-ups. We're testing it. And this is working overseas. Um, in the cloud, so this is uh, it's very exciting, and again, this sort of three-dimensional environment that we're coordinating, um, scheduling, all of this ties in. I think more of this will be covered uh, shortly. I want to sort of reset this if I can. Um, Jonathan, there you go. Yeah, uh, can do you? Will you be able to give me control as well? I think you should have it now. So if your arrow keys should work. Okay. Yeah, I do that. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So my name is Jonathan Asher. I was the director of design technology at Zayner up until last month when I transferred to uh, to Dassault Systems, headquartered in Paris now, or based in Paris, as the AEC role portfolio manager. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about Zayner and the work that that we did at Zayner and that they continue to do at Zayner. Uh, they, I presented at Co last year, uh, last spring. So some of this has has been uh, seen before at at Co. Kansas City is the headquarters for Zayner. They have a shop in Dallas. Uh, right now it's uh, 117 years going strong. It's a family-run business and it's fourth generation. It was initially a sheet mill company, very traditional work, uh, with very few people in the office and a, a very large number of people in the field, and that, that has since the 1990s flipped over, and now it's uh, very office-centric, very engineering-heavy, with a few very specialized uh, uh, foremen in the field running our installation team. We work all over the world. Um, go to the website. You can find a, a job near you. Uh, we've worked with a large number of very famous architects, Frank Gehry, Randall Stout, Zaha Hadid. Um, who else here? Morphosis. Doing uh, complex, flamboyant cultural buildings. And since 2010 have been using digital project to TFV5. The we've switched since switched over in the last uh, six months to the 3D experience and and although I'm not going to show anything done in the 3D experience, I can tell you with 100% confidence that it's moving forward. So to talk a little bit about how we set up our models, there's uh, five parts to each model. There's the driver model, which is like the skeleton equivalent in Katia, generative power copies, parametric power copies, automation and knowledge patterns, and then this integrated master model. Uh, the contextual driver model is going to be plane surfaces, points, grids. Here's a look at an example of that with surfaces. We have generative power copies then that we layer on top of those surfaces. Those are primarily knowledge patterns. Uh, that produced lists of geometry, discrete geometry. Here's my favorite example. It's the smart device. It's parameterized. It's a knowledge, there's a knowledge pattern. It produced lists of geometry. 
here are those lists, and those lists then are become the inputs for other generative power copies. And then the data flows through these lists, and we can build one on top of the other. Here's a look at the uh, intersect power copy that used the, the planes from the smart divide power copy to, to generate horizontal lines through these surfaces that are used in subsequent power copies to generate geometry. And we have a, we have a library of these. So here's a look at, at P through T, opening up the smart divide folder, and there's the, the CATIA B5, different variations of that smart divide. Some make circles, some do multi-domain curves, some small divide multi-domain curves, some do rectangles, some do uh, uh, other, some are embedded in rules, some are embedded in, in knowledge patterns. Uh, and then we have our parametric power copies. These parametric power copies are, are embedded with the generative power copies so that as the geometry changes, they're able to adapt intelligently based on rules that we've defined. Here's actually a smart divide embedded in a slice plate. And then we have automation power copies that instantiate parametric power copies using the generative power copies as inputs. Here's a look at an automation instantiator. It's a simple wireframe, but when you did in, and it instantiates these power copies. This power copy instantiates more power copies. I won't go into the details, but suffice it to say there's a, a parameter, it's instantiated, a parameter switches that activates a reaction. That reaction activates and uh, executes knowledge patterns that all interact with each other. In the end, you get these assemb these beautiful assemblies that in context form the structure for our system. We did not do the primary steel here. That was done in, in Tecla, uh, but we did the aluminum structure. All of our structure, all of our parts integrated with the architect's model, the structural model, the MEP model, are integrated into the what, I, what we call the Zaner Integrated Master Model. There's an example of the Edmonton Downtown Arena and, and a shot of construction as of yesterday. Uh, the model of development, the model development process is iterative. So we'll start with a very, we'll start with the wireframes. We'll develop very light data heavy power copies and then we'll, we'll develop further. The power copies will become uh, more geometry heavy. So here's a light model where we're focused more on data. I'll look at the curtain wall for the Edmonton Arena. That data is extracted so we can order material, we can analyze the geometric properties and make sure that everything fits within our system tolerances, and then, and then build the heavy model, the template that includes the drawing that gets sent to the fabric to, in this case, we don't do curtain wall, so that gets sent to the fabricator. We do the engineering, not the fabrication for the, for the curtain wall. Uh, here's a look at one project that opened earlier this month. We'll run through this quick. It's the Peterson Automotive Museum, designed by Cohen, Peterson, Fox. Scope of our work are these external ribbons. Well, at least the scope that I'll discuss is the external ribbons and the structure and the design of the structure to support them on the roof. These are, there were 200 or so ribbons that were broken down into a, a kit of parts with a, a primary structural pipe as the internal structure and then horizontal or vertical fins to form the shape and horizontal fins to, to support those, those verticals and then skins on top. So the template, beginning with the pipe, we add the boots, uh, put the vertical fins on, and this is all automated by the way that's instantiating with knowledge patterns using these power copies add the skins, that template instantiates the drawing, the drawing that goes to the shop that includes the bill of material. The parts are assembled in the shop, the parts are stack, stacked on a, on a truck, and the trucks are sequenced in such a way that they arrive on site uh, in an orderly fashion. So they go to the they go to the yard in a pre-planned order because we thought the engineers have, have thought that through. 
They're delivered truck by truck to the site where they're picked up to the top of the building for staging on in 10 minutes or so. And then and, and we leave the skins in the, the interstitial skins off for finishing so that they can be finished on site. We'll look at some of the shots from above, shots from outside. And there you have it. That's great. Javier, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you control. Um, of mouse control, so you should be able to use the arrows, Javier, to, to navigate. All right, let me give it a shot here. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, very tough act to follow. <laughs> that was pretty impressive. Um, so I'm going to, I actually don't have control just yet, it looks like. Oh, there we go. Never mind. I think we're good. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do, I'll be able to do a very brief uh, introduction on the company. We're a pretty young company. Um, we're, we started uh, just shy of two years ago. Um, the reason we chose Katia uh, and well now 3D Experience Platform is we, we touch a lot of aspects of the basically every single aspect of a building um, from architecture, structure, uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, civil, uh, obviously facades, prefab, a lot of prefab work. So we needed to, do, to find a tool that can um, basically do from soup to nuts everything we needed. So early stage computation, parametric modeling, clash tools, bill material takeoffs, um, the ability to, to load very complex and large assemblies, which is really a, a big differentiator, we believe, and to be able to make changes in real time, which is a big differentiator for, for example, on site, working with a subcontractor, they don't have time to, uh, to just look at a picture and then come back with a, in a week later with an answer. They need answers uh, yesterday. So the ability, the ability to direct model in the site and, or um, make changes in real time is very powerful. And then, of course, all the automation and prefabrication on the back end. So direct to CNC via step file uh, is, a, is a big differentiator. So as a small company, as you can imagine, it's a big investment for us. But um, we, we, we went uh, this route. Uh, my partner that I started a company with had some experience there, so it made a lot of sense, um, and it's a, it's a good differentiator for us. So I'm going to try to get through a lot of slides as well. I tried to make some changes here. So we, we call this computational construction, so we wanted to show some, some UDFs um, and some automation that we do to solve just regular problems in construction. So obviously there's a lot of facade work, which we do a lot of. I won't talk much about facades today because I think uh, the value proposition would be better at talking about other areas, but step footings, things that are not necessarily the most glamorous, but are big problems. You know, geotechnical has rules on, on footing elevations. Structural engineer has rules on, uh, on slopes between two to one slope between footing. Um, and then you're trying to optimize the amount of excavation versus how much formwork and concrete you're going to do. So be able to, to create tools that allow us to quickly do that analysis. Uh, is very powerful. So we just generate UDFs and tools as we need for our for our projects on the, on the services side, and then we you know we can use those tools repeatedly in other projects or to solve other problems along the value chain for our clients. So this is just a little bit of a some visuals on on tools being built. The next one is uh, this one we threw in kind of late. So this is a template we designed, uh, basically a UDF that allows us to create one template that this is actually uh, for, a, for a project that's designed by Bjark Ingalls Group is a very complicated twisting tower actually up here in the Pacific Northwest in Vancouver. There's between 8,000 and 9,000 panels and probably 3,000 different panel types. So as you can imagine, it's very difficult <laughs> for the, and the, the fabricators in Korea. So what we've done is created one UDF. We took all the window types and put them in Excel with the dimension. So we batch, batch create all the window types using a catalog component, or you can do it with a script using an engineering template to generate all the types. And then you can locate uh, on the facade of the building. Typically, we use if the structural engineer has a Revit file, we'll, we'll import the Revit file as a surface to reference the slab edges. And then we can locate in the assembly the layout floor by floor uh, using a script from that same Excel file. So, um, and then we just basically update. 
So this one template covers about 95% of, of, the, of the panels we're going to see in the building. There are some uh, atypical panels that we couldn't cover, but it's, it's an interesting way to use automation and scripting and, and tooling. This is all in V6 with EKL um, to be able to solve you know, problems at fabrication level. So we can give an IFC file back to the architect for them to open in Revit and, and verify. And we can also give a step file to the fabricators so they can integrate into G-code or whatever. Process. I think they use a luminar extrusion process here. But if they were using a CNC, they could use that, that geometry direct for their fabrication process. Um, the next one is this in loads. So I'm going to move a little. So this is another interesting one where you have kind of the problem we're solving a lot of times in construction, very much that Adam said, is, is this kind of fragmented, disconnected workflow, um, both by contracts, by technology adoption, um, and by goals, it's, it's not necessarily incentivized for people to work well together. So this project here is an aquatic center. It's very complicated. The primary steel was done in Tecla by the fabricator. We imported that into our model and then modeled everything basically based on it was a 2D workflow in this case. So we just took PDFs, modeled all the duct work. We have the suspended ceiling panels. And this, this one area was, was very complicated. It had compound angles with steel stud, um, multiple uh, reflective, it's basically a giant mess of reflected ceiling plan. So our, our, our client asked us to come in and kind of figure it out for them. So we were able to build eight UDFs, so cross studs, suspended light duct framing, the hangers, and then the script automatically places everything in the optimal condition. And then what the last output of this we don't show is actually did the layout for them on field. So typically this is figured out in the field and for people that aren't in AEC, they probably wonder why they do that. It's the lowest risk way to do it, but it's also the slowest way. <laughs> so they're going to figure it out. The people on site are very smart. It's just it's going to take a lot of time. So the owner, that time is worth something. And that, so we try to sell back time to the project by using this automation and tool kit. Um, so that's one example there. This is the final output. So you get very complex compound angle area with steel stud. And there's basically eight trades would have had to work together to get this done. So we were able to bang it up pretty quick. To probably took us about a week and a half to do this, where if you would manually model this, it would probably take, I don't even know, eight or nine, maybe ten weeks. So we were able to save a lot of time using tools. Uh, the next one, this one is an interesting one. So uh, we get a lot of, you know, it's not necessarily sexy, to be honest with you, but, you know, steel stud and drywall guys, right? And they, the way they estimate and do their workflows is pretty rudimentary. So we built a tool for, for this project that is essentially a, basically generating lines and points in a model that we reference on top of, of a, just a 2D drawing. And then we're able to create this giant template that has you know, a bunch of parameters that can be adjusted by the, by the steel stud guy. So they can go in and put the distance between the studs. They can do offsets. They can change the, the, dis, the, the direction of the steel studs. And then the, we don't show it here, but the final output is actually a bill of materials with every single steel stud they need, um, all the drywall, total takeoff of drywall area, and the drawings they need for their, they don't really do fabrication, but all the information they need to basically build this and with no waste. So the, to understand why this is an interesting value proposition, traditionally the estimating and drywall is done very much with the, you know, a thumb suck, and they just you know, kind of take a set of drawings, they say we roughly need this, and then they just cut and fit everything on site which leads to a lot of waste. And if you multiply that at scale, you get a lot of waste per project that adds up to cost. And, and typically, you know, we're trying to give a tool to be much more precise with that work. The next one is, uh, um, so there's another screenshot of it. Um, so rebar, rebar is traditionally not something we <laughs> do that often. Very rarely do you need rebar, but uh, we had a couple situations where it was actually needed. And so instead of just kind of trying to figure it out, we just spent the time and built our own tool. So the, this rebar tool um, it basically allows us to click points and, and then have a set of parameters that you can adjust the thickness, the size of the rebar. Uh, you, can tr you, know, you have a knowledge pattern that's extended by this where you can place it into walls and, and very quickly, rapidly instantiate the tool to any complex geometry. Now, where this is interesting is, for example, a precast workflow. So, you know, when you get up in the big bar, say 12 bar, you start having a very big nominal diameter. And then the ribs on those bars can be, you know, a half inch on each side sometimes. So, um, you know, having full control over that from a coordination perspective, specifically when you're trying to look at sleeve penetrations in a precast process, uh, if there's post tension that has to be dealt with, it can be very difficult on a precast side. So have full control and automation over this um, is pretty powerful. So we, we built this and we've used it a few times. Um, next is kinematics. 
uh, I'm not an expert on kinematics, so I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly. But we just recently uh, looked at kinematics. One of our uh, employees did his master's in mechanical engineering thesis on kin kinematics and CATIA, so using Delmia. Pretty interesting. So you basically just give all the parameters. This is a uh, BMU, it's called. It's, it's a big tower that cleans windows and has a number of luffing areas and all these different uh, inputs that needed to be uh, factored. So you know, using Delmi, it's pretty powerful. You just basically enter all the, the data that you require, all the inputs that are required, and then CATIA itself uh, generates what they call here um, like a volume. So it automatically on its own will, will just get all those spots. And the reason we did this was for coordination. There's actually a core, concrete core, right on the back tail of this BMU that the uh, builder, who's our client, was nervous about. And sure enough, using this kinematics, we found that the, the, the location based on the shop drawings given by the BMU installer do not work. Um, based on the you know based on the actual built what will be built on site, and the way we got to that conclusion was using kinematics. So it's it's pretty interesting. So uh, Delmi is, is something that we've been kind of uh, uh, trying to experiment with uh, on the 4D side. This is a an, another twisting tower uh, with complicated facade pieces, and we just did a a, a little simulation based on uh, you know a lot of different panels in this one corner detail, which we try to determine what is the best way to get this in, and when you start getting with the installer, and you know, again, labor cost per per hour is, is the biggest risk in their in their business. Figuring all this out in a in a you know, we just did one one corner here very quickly using Delmia to be able to identify a, a few areas which they know that are going to slow them down, and then we're putting in actionable plans to be able to solve that before they even mobilize on site. So this project is still in the ground, and we're already figu figuring out the 15th, 16th, 40th floor with them. Very uh, atypical in construction. We also use Delmia to tell stories. So <laughs> this is uh, probably uh, not the most technical, but it's uh, for you for stakeholder engagement purposes. It's it's not a bad tool to be able to say, okay, at, uh, you know, how can we uh, look at this complex podium area? Uh, where should we be in the in the Gantt schedule? Um, how what's the what's the sequence of how things come together on this very complicated uh, carved tower? They call it. And you know, how can we, you know, we're using the, the assumptions based on a one-dimensional Gantt chart developed by the contractor and then our modeling process in Delmia to test those assumptions. And then in the next extension of this is resource planning, almost like an M-bomb. You know, how much do material do we need on site on Thursday of week 52? And then we start, you know, taking it to that level of detail. If there's a, a, a hiccup in the schedule, you know, how can we move resources to another, how do we visualize moving resources to another part of the building? And then rerunning a simulation to optimize those resources and time. The big factor is time. So um, I'm going to fly through here because uh, I want to talk a little bit MEP side. So I think three minutes. I got to be done in three minutes. I'm going to fly through this. We think there's a huge amount of potential with V6 and the MEP side, especially with Mayor Worf being announced yesterday going on to this shipbuilding is probably the most relevant uh, other industry to AEC that we're trying to learn a lot from. So the MEP side is interesting. So what you can do uh, is you can set up all your, on the technology side, you send all your specifications, captures, and reuse, basically a master catalog, which we're in the process of doing that now, uh, depending on what, what our projects. We, we can create standard catalog processes of Victaulic Elbow that we've created uh, based on Victaulic's shop drawings. Yes, it's a little labor intensive, but we can control the QAQC on the on the data on the on the level of detail, the fabrication level of detail information, uh, and create our standard standard catalog parts. And then the next step step is to have all your specifications directly from your master spec. So your master spec drives everything. Uh, then you do that your 3D layout design. So this is a, a different pro very large 600 million dollar casino project where we're laying everything out to make sure it works. And then you can take that into use scripting for QAQC. So we wrote a script here that allows a manager to go into every elbow and determine if that elbow has as meets 90. So you get 544 problems. So one of our employees got got in trouble that day. <laughs> but uh, so we went in through and said, okay, you know, it has 90, 45, and 22.5 degree elbows with a tolerance of 0.2 degrees. And if everywhere that we find that there's a it's off tolerance, these red bulbs show up. And that allows us to have an enhanced QAQC process with what we're sending out the door. Specifically, when we're doing prefab work, it's very important. And then the last step, which is a big differentiator we can do all in CATIA, is, is the 3D detailing for fabrication. 
and be able to take it to you know tolerance level modeling with all you know components and and then finally iso drying and bomb so we can give a sheet to uh, you know a pipe fitter and a groover that just takes this has exactly the amount of couplings uh, joints flanges valves etc and just basically pre pre cut pipe pre weld pre weld if needed and then ship it to site already assembled so the last thing I want to talk really I got I got no time left here so this is 18 story wood frame building from day one we're involved building the whole it's basically a giant manufacturing project we use almost every part of Katia V6 on it Delmia uh, this is a mock-up. It's never been built before. It'll be the tallest wood frame building in the world when it's complete. It's currently under construction. We did about a $150,000 mock-up here. It doesn't look that complicated, but there's 18 different connection points that were being tested by the structural engineer. So there's wood to wood, wood with steel. Uh, so everything in this mock-up came from our model. So we did uh, the build materials. We sent a step file to the fabricator that just put into their uh, into their uh, CNC process. We gave them a DXF file to regenerate shop drawings that were closed envelope and reproof. We actually did our own shop drawings as well as a governance kind of a, a secondary tool for for review, um, as you can see right there. And, and you know the power of obviously you can see people on this call know is, is that automation of the shop drawing process. We did all the concrete detailing that connected with the with the wood in this case all came from the same model. Uh, as you can see, the level of detail is pretty precise. Every nut, every bolt, every screw, and then uh, they they installed it as per our model. And it was uh, I think it, it, it took 60% off the the budgeted time. So this was kind of a proof of concept that we could probably do 18 stories pretty fast. So the building has a concrete uh, podium at the first floor, and then two concrete cores, and the rest is uh, glue lamp columns with steel connectors and CLT cross laminated timber panels that connect into the core so doing 18 story wood frame building a seismic area is pretty pretty crazy as you can see we have every single screw in the entire building is in our model and why is that because they're two dollars per screw <laughs> so it's pretty expensive and they wanted to know exactly what the magnitude of, of based on the engineering assumptions of how many screws have to be close together uh, you know where where it's all going to be from a cost perspective. Then we did all the MEP at fabrication level, so the entire building level of definition 400 they call it for fabrication. So at the next one you can see all the you know coupling everything there, and we've optimized with the mechanical contractor to make sure that it's laid and we save as many elbows as possible. Um, and we make sure that everything's pre CNC'd, all the penetrations for the risers are pre CNC'd in the panels, and you have 18 stories of. Uh, so right now we can do a calculation of every single FJ clamp. If that's uh, if they have it in there, which is pretty powerful and not typically done in construction. Um, and there you go. So the, the, la the last one is just kind of gives you another. Uh, we took the steel stud right down to the studs. So every we actually the nice thing from a Katia side, we did the third floor, which is pretty repetitious, right down to the studs at the highest level of detail. And I just created a giant power copy that had one customization at the ninth floor. The column size has changed a bit. So we just had a little customization there, but we were able to do one floor and then bang up you know, 19, 17 other floors uh, exactly the same. So it was very efficient from time. So I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you for your time, and uh, and I'll pass it back to John. Thank you, Javier. That's phenomenal work. I mean, it's, it, there you know there was a logical sort of sequence to this. Um, you know, moving from academia to to facades to fabrication to the rest of the building, which is it's really sort of uncharted territory for AEC uh, to have that level of coordination. So I mean, everyone, you know, fantastic work, um, and we're we're happy to answer any any questions. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions, they can enter them into the toolbar. I guess while while we're waiting for questions, uh, Javier, out of curiosity, sort of how that that level of work you said it's a relatively new company. What how long is that sort of body of work? What's the duration of that? Um, so we yeah I mean we try to put in uh, as, as much as we have pretty broad scope. So we've been at it for about twenty one months. Okay. Um, in, in that time frame, we've done thirty five projects over three billion in construction, um, a residential, commercial. Uh, light industrial and now we're doing a lot of heavy industrial so right now I'm looking across the office here we're doing a wastewater treatment plant prefab spooling the entire thing off-site and two 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 workstations down they're doing a, a complicated twisting facade that's being fabricated in Korea and built in Calgary Alberta so 
we're trying. We got pretty bre pretty big breadth, and we're, again, we're using we're not hedged. We use Katia for everything. And so we we do have a question that came in um, uh, asking if we're we and I guess it's, it's any of us are are the subcontract track subcontractors. Are we working with Katia V five subcontractors? I assume that you know that's that's meaning do the, do we typically work with stuff that that are in the same platform, or do we have to do that ourselves? I'll, I'll guess I'll go first because um, we touch, we work with a lot of subcontractors. No, <laughs> no, yeah. and I think you alluded on. I mean, it's just um, if you look at the value chain of a project, you have so many different softwares being used, which is why interoperability is so important for us. So. Um, yeah, it's very rarely. I, I mean, I'd love to come across a project where someone was like, "Yeah, I'll give you a Katia model." It's gonna be like that. Yeah, great. exactly. But uh, <laughs> but uh, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, I mean, us also. I, I would imagine, like the, the body of work shown here, the cross section. It's this is it's rare. Currently, um, we're working at a higher again a higher resolution. I think that what buildings are typically coordinated at certainly the insides of buildings. Um, this is new territory, but because of the, the level of coordination that that it, it offers, uh, we do we do see this as the, the evolution. This is this is the natural progression of the building industry of AEC, and Dassault has a you know has a has a very serious role to play in that. Um, there's there's not really any other sort of parallel system that that's offering this right now. So, Tori, I don't know if I have to enter exit the question. I'm sorry, Adam. Just one. Will I have to stop the question, or would a new one just come in, Tori? Um, a new one should have come in. Okay. Sorry, Adam. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Jonathan, I was actually just going to add that you know, in, in terms of where we're seeing this too, I think there's, I've seen a number of efforts to um, create uh, fabrication shops where prefab and or modular is is done more holistically, and and there there's. I, I see adoption of Katia and 3D experience. Right. Um, you know, for fabricators that are expecting to work in the field and kind of be in a in the typical niche of um, of, <coughs> of a traditional AAC process, I think there's less incentive. And from Vayner's perspective, there's we're generally the subcontractor. We don't usually interface with many people that work in Katia. There's one exception, and that would be Morphosis, the architecture architecture shop in California. We've done a number of jobs with them where we've interfaced with Katia, uh, digital projects. So we have a, we have a couple couple other questions. Just quick a quick one. I think I can feel. What is AEC uh, planning at at Co at the conference this year? Which is a good spot to sort of mention that um, you know we've we've been asked to just to um, uh, to remind people that membership renewals for Co for the 2016 year um, is available on the website and that um, the tech conference the annual PLM experience and tech and affair uh, that's going to be in San Antonio this year from April 10th to 13th uh, that, again that's on the website to register but that point a this will be the first official dedicated spot for AEC, Architecture, Engineering, Construction, at Co. And we think it's very important because, we, again, these, these summits and sort of conventions exist for other areas of construction. And this is really centered around the, the tools, the software that we believe will transform the industry. Um, so, you know, we plan on having sort of workshops. Um, there, there will be presentations, more in-depth presentation case studies, some exciting Things that are uh, sort of in the works now, uh, but we are planning on having uh, several breakout presentations, uh, of sort of main stage presentation, and a, a presence at the Co um, University. So there'll be a hands-on workshop. <coughs> um, there is, and again, that, I think that information will become available on the website as as we develop it. Um, someone. Asked, would you say that automation of shop drawing production has improved significantly over V5? It's interesting, uh, and that question was for Javier, <laughs> so I won't answer that. <laughs> um, he followed up with another statement. So, Javi? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, has it improved? Uh, it depends how you look. So, 
I would say um, my my line for V5, it's like an old tank, right? It's like an old 50 Studebaker. That thing runs forever. It's, it's rock solid. Um, and the, uh, the V6 on the cloud, we use everything on the cloud, is like the, the Porsche uh, 911. You know, it's you know, it's amazing. It's fast. It's, but, you know, yeah, it's still, it's, they're still working out some kinks. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, but the thing where it's really powerful, I think, on the shop trying side is the tool safe for fluid 3D systems designer. Like, there's pre-automated shop drawing tools for, for MEP, for example. So all those spool drawings and the ISOs I showed you with the bill materials, it's automated process. You set it up at once, and then you automate it out. Um, so V6 shop drawing-wise, I'd say, is, is, is oh, from 2014X to 2015X, you know, much, much better. And 2015X to 2016X, we anticipate, will be even better. So, um, you know, it, it, I don't, is it better? I don't know if I'll say it's better, but it, it's definitely... Uh, comparable and I think getting better I think that's that's the key and, you know I'll, I'll just add one thing to that in, in terms of shop drawings um, you know shop drawing is an interesting thing which uh, we, I suspect they might mean something in, in different industries again we can only sort of speak to AEC where the traditional process is again there's an architectural set of intent you hand that over to someone weeks later the actual design um, the fabricators or contractors will come up with the actual design, submit that for approval. It either meets or doesn't meet the architectural intent. It's sent back. The whole shop drawing review process, because architects are not intimately involved with the fabrication traditionally, is a very inefficient process. All of this has the promise to sort of reform shop drawings as we as we understand them. The idea of reviewing models in the context of our design. 3D environments, looking at the details, all of this could drastically change how we sort of relay information. Um, will so there's a question: Will those who presented today um, be at the co conference? Um, we're I, everyone. I, we're all planning on attending, <laughs> so I can't guarantee anyone, but I, I, I will be there. Yeah, CAD makers will be there. Yeah. Jonathan? Uh, Dassault Systems will most definitely be there. I will be there as well. I'm definitely there. Adam and I will ride in a van together. Mm -hmm. Cross country. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we'll all be there. <laughs> okay, well we are just past the hour. I want to thank all of our presenters and all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, if any other questions come in, feel free to email co at co.org and we'll make sure to get them to everyone so that you can get your question answered. Um, and yeah, so thank you everyone. It was a great presentation. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Tori, for organizing everything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your time. Have a good day, everyone. Cheers.